welcome everybody to this um, to this session. Um, we're going to talk today about um, the opportunities and challenges for using um, big data, new data sources uh, in uh, migration research and policies, but also from a broader perspective uh, for the humanitarian uh, field. Uh, my name is uh, Bas Belsma. I'm uh, founder of Data for Peace and Security, and I will uh, moderate the session uh, today. So we have three uh, amazing uh, panelists with us today. Uh, Marcia Rengo, uh, Tyler Redford, and Linus Bankston. I will introduce them uh, uh, shortly. Um, and we'll uh, basically do three things. First, um, each of the panelists will introduce their, their work, uh, explain what they're doing, how they're making uh, use of data um, uh, for migration research and policy making, but also uh, for the border humanitarian field. Um, after that, we will have um, a brief conversation about some of the challenges and obstacles that they have encountered, that you as an audience may also have encountered in your work and how they have overcome those obstacles. Uh, and then there will be, I will make sure as a moderator, there will be plenty of time for a QA and uh, with you as the audience as well. So if you have any questions or any burning issues on your mind, feel free to share them in the chat. Um, we will see them as well. Um, and I will try to uh, insert them into our conversation right away or save them for the, for the Q&A. Um, and we'll end uh, in uh, one hour minus two minutes from now. Um, so before we start, I wanted to say uh, one more thing. Um, this session is being recorded um, and it will be available on the NYUCAC YouTube channel uh, afterwards and I think also on the conference uh, website. So if you enjoy this session so much, you want to share it with all your friends and your network, feel free to do so. Okay, so let us start with some uh, introductory remarks from the panelists about um, the potential and practice of using data in their work. Um, uh, I will introduce the panelists first before giving uh, Marcia the floor. Um, Marcia is uh, the Data uh, Innovation and Capacity Building Coordinator at IOM's Global Migration Data Analysis Center in Berlin. Um, this center is the co-convener of the Big Data for Migration Alliance, and Marcia leads the center's work on uh, data capacity building and data innovation. Um, she's also currently managing a project focusing on migration uh, on the central Mediterranean route. And prior to joining uh, the center at IOM, she also worked at IOM's research unit in Geneva, and before that as a research assistant at the Refugee Studies Center um, at the University of Oxford, amongst many other things as well. Um, uh, thanks, Marcia, for being here and looking very much forward to your uh, introduction and remarks. Um, but first, let me introduce also Tyler, Tyler Redford from the Open Humanitarian Street Map. Um, he serves as the executive director at the moment. Um, and in his role at, um, uh, at the Humanitarian Open Street Map team, also known as HOT or HOT. What is it, Tyler? Is it HOT or HOT? HOT or HOT are both fine and welcome. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll use HOT, that's, uh, that's more fun. So uh, at HOT, Tyler oversees a team of 100 staff deployed globally and works to engage and coordinate the efforts of thousands of HOT disaster mapping volunteers for projects around the world. And uh, prior to joining HOT, um, uh, Tyler, amongst other things, led um, uh, many technology and data-enabled projects across the public, private, and international humanitarian um, uh, sectors uh, as a consultant for Deloitte. And if that's not enough, he also led the American Red Cross Hurricane Sandy uh, Community Disaster Recovery Strategy and the response. So welcome, Tyler. Uh, looking forward to your uh, remarks. And then uh, Linus will also um, be here today. Thank you, Linus. Uh, he leads uh, Flowminders Board uh, and is closely involved in the foundation's strategic work as well. He supports the development of Flowminders projects and services uh, and uh, also his strategic relationships. He co-founded Flowminer in 2012 and was his executive director uh, for his first decade of operations. He uh, pioneered, and he will also talk about this, uh, the use of mobile uh, operator data in Haiti to monitor population displacement during the 2010 earthquake in Haiti, um, and as well as for predicting the spread of cholera during the severe, severe outbreak that's in here. 
And his academic research at Karolinska Institute has focused on public health applications of information technology in low income session settings. So uh, welcome, uh, great that you uh, are here today with us. And uh, without further ado, I want to give the floor to you, Marcia, to uh, share your, uh, your remarks with us. Thank you so much, Bas, and hello, everyone. Thank you for having me in this event. I'm really honored to be sharing this panel with, uh, be intimidated, but to be quite honest, with Linus and, and Tyler, I really uh, admire uh, their work uh, as well. So I'm just going to share my screen. I prepared a few, um, a few slides, but uh, I probably won't have the time to, <laughs> to show them all, but just uh, uh, please let me know if you're, if you can see it, not yet. Let me put it in there. Can you see this now? This is fine. Very good. Thank you so much. I just uh, a few words uh, that I want to say, first of all, about uh, the Global Migration Data Analysis Center, uh, in case uh, people uh, in the room are not familiar with it. But the center was launched by IOM in 2015 uh, with the aim of responding to calls for better international migration. Uh, data and analysis and improve uh, understanding of migration statistics, but also access to migration data uh, to facilitate the use of migration data for policy and also inform the public debate on migration. And we have several areas of work um, that correspond to you know, three key objectives. One is to strengthen uh, the global evidence base on migration and access to the data, as I was saying, through tools such as the Global Migration Data Portal, for instance. Uh, the second one is to develop and strengthen capacities uh, on migration data collection and analysis and use for policy uh, around the world, particularly in low-income and middle-income settings. And um, we've done quite a bit of work uh, in Africa, but we also work in other regions uh, in this sense. And we have a, a strong collaboration now with the African Union uh, in this regard. And the third uh, objective and area of work is to support uh, evidence-based programs, policies, and communications. Uh, we have several projects, uh, Missing Migrants Project, collecting data on migrant fatalities around the world, um, migration governance indicators, for instance, uh, so uh, sort of um, uh, measuring um, uh, or assessing, assessing migration governance structures around the world. Uh, and also supporting impact evaluation of uh, IOM programs and policies. So just to say that, just to sort of uh, locate uh, the work on data innovation at, at GMDAC in this, uh, in this bigger picture. So uh, our work on, on data innovation is, is to basically also encourage and facilitate uh, data innovation, innovation, migration data collection analysis, uh, and promote the responsible use of new data sources to understand uh, migration-related patterns. And, you know, we started looking at this topic actually when I was in the research unit in Geneva um, before uh, GMDAC was established. And, you know, we came across the work by Linus and Flominder and others, you know, that were using uh, mobile phone data, social media data, all kinds of data sources that we hadn't really, you know, in the statistical and migration community considered as, uh, as potential sources of information on uh, relevant to migration, right? And then we started collecting all these examples and practices and, uh, and talking about uh, also the need to go beyond the traditional data sources uh, on migration, which are obviously essential, but sometimes are not sufficient. And we're still facing enormous gaps in our understanding of migration, uh, different migration relevant topics. You know, um, we, even to this day, the best uh, sort of data and um, uh, sort of that we have on migrant stocks. So the number of international migrants around the world is an estimate and is based on national population censuses that can be several years old and can be incomplete when it comes to disaggregation by, by age and by sex. And so the point is, on the other hand, there's an abundance of data, a huge amount of data that is already there. It's already collected. It's in, you know, in the hands of private entities uh, often. Uh, but could be potentially harnessed and has been harnessed successfully um, you know, uh, by uh, instance, the people who join me on this panel to uh, understand and inform migration related patterns. And so the point becomes then how do we systematize and how do we facilitate uh, these kinds of partnerships and how do we improve also use of um, you know, innovative methods, analytical methods and use of new technologies, machine learning, artificial based intelligence, um, artificial intelligence based tools to um, understand 
the things that are still quite hard to understand uh, based on, on traditional statistics uh, and methods. And so from that understanding, we studied, you know, we brought together all these different practices. We, uh, and after the workshop that we organized together with the European Commission in uh, 2017, actually, we decided to launch uh, an initiative, a dedicated initiative to accelerate the responsible and ethical use of new data sources uh, to support migration uh, policy and, and programs. And that's the Big Data for Migration Alliance that I'm representing here today. And actually the Gov Lab at New York University also joined uh, in these efforts. So this was launched in 2018. Uh, we, have, we actually organized um, an event ourselves just two days ago, uh, looking at different topics. First of all, you know, what are the policy the policy needs, the needs, uh, the demand sort of uh, the demand side for innovation, right? Because otherwise we'll just be talking about the innovation for the sake of innovation. We have to really be clear about uh, the needs and the policy um, and programming needs uh, where data gaps are mostly felt. And, you know, there's um, obviously priority topics uh, nowadays that we discussed, uh, environmental related migration, climate change, uh, induced mobility and migration and uh, the impact of health, for instance, on migrants and, uh, and all of these topics. But there is, uh, you know, there are several, uh, several sort of questions that are still hard to understand through traditional statistics. Uh, and uh, anyways, you will find the, you'll find the details about this event that won't go on and on because time is short. But basically, we have various um, areas, again, of work and various uh, objectives and uh, for the Big Data for Migration Alliance. One is to bring all this knowledge on data innovation for migration together. You know, uh, there are lots of innovation actually ongoing, more than that we are able actually to track. Uh, and so um, we're trying to facilitate also access to these different innovation practices. We put together a data innovation directory on the migration data portal that basically summarizes uh, information about you know, all these different applications and provides a a way to um, you know, access knowledge and, and understand, share knowledge about these data innovations and understand what has worked well and what has worked less well in which context, what are the data, which data sources have, you know, new data sources have helped to uh, understand certain questions about migration. Um, and uh, we believe that by collecting these practices, you know, it will be also easier to replicate uh, them around the world. I'm sorry, we'll just have to go very quickly. And then another uh, other things that we do is obviously we also conduct research and analysis um, together with our partners on different topics. And here I'm just going to mention a couple of examples uh, on the use of social media data. First, you know, for instance, to now cast uh, or estimate the number of international migrants around the world, for instance, using the uh, Facebook data, the advertising platform. Um, this is just a chart showing uh, what we did together with the European Commission and uh, Emilia Zagini, Uma Weber, uh, and, and other partners. We looked at uh, a comparison between national statistics uh, and, uh, and regional statistics, actually official statistics from Eurostat and Facebook data on the number of uh, Venezuelan migrants and refugees in Spain over a, a certain period of time. Um, and, and we noticed sort of that, uh, you know, the pattern and the, the trend, the increasing trend that could, uh, could be seen through uh, the Facebook advertising platform in terms of monthly active users of Facebook from Venezuela in Spain, uh, you know, during that period was basically following uh, the same trend that was later identified in official statistics. And this is, you know, there's obviously uh, lots of, of biases, and I'm sure we'll, we'll get into this and the challenges of using these data sources, but there's also an enormous potential to identify maybe trends as they're happening early on, and that per se uh, can be you know, an, important, um, uh, an important element to consider for, for policymakers as well. And obviously, these have to be later identified and validated, and you know, there's lots of bias also uh, has to be uh, sort of corrected for, but this sort of early indication is very, um, you know, um, is very relevant from a policy-making perspective. Quickly also to another, um, uh, another thing that we've been experimenting with is use of Google Trends index data to um, anticipate or, or try and estimate migration intentions uh, around the world. And this is just a chart showing uh, sort of the um, Google Trends searches for um, Terminal, terms related to asylum and migration uh, from uh, Syria uh, to Sweden, and then the uh, official statistics in terms of uh, inflows or 
um, of migrant inflows uh, to, to Syria, uh, to uh, Sweden, sorry, from Spain the, over the same period of time. And there's a, you know, a clear coloration, a bit of a delay. So in certain cases, sort of this type of analysis, again, shows that um, you know, Google Trends Index and other, uh, other data sources as well on migration intentions can potentially tell us a little bit about future, uh, future actual migration uh, to certain countries. But this relationship is only valid, you know, through for certain corridors and certain specific cases. And so there's a, a need for a lot more experimentation in this regard uh, and, uh, and consideration also of the challenges and um, language and, um, and other challenges related to, uh, to the use of, media, uh, of these data sources as well. Uh, another example um, uh, is the use of uh, Twitter data against social media data. And here is uh, less to, uh, you know, away from estimating only stocks and migration uh, movements and numbers of migrants and flows, but also to study public opinion about migration, how people feel about migrants and migration in different countries. Uh, and so we looked at, uh, together with the University of Liverpool and Francisco Roa and team, we looked at um, a sentiment towards migrants uh, on Twitter in the early stages of the pandemic, in the pre and post pandemic period. Uh, so from December 2019 and April 2020, analyzing over 30 million tweets uh, in five countries, uh, in particular the ones you see uh, here on the right and conducted sentiment analysis and topic modeling of what, you know, how sort of sentiment towards migrants and migration may have shifted or not. And, and we, you know, like we don't need to go into the finding, but these are certain sort of type of, you know, the examples of how uh, these data can be used to also analyze the other topics that are not necessarily, you know, estimating um, uh, stocks and flows and, and migration movements. Again, with all the limitations, right, that, uh, that, these, uh, that these represent, uh, in the case of Twitter, obviously, you know, the penetration rates and the, the fact that, the, again, with, as in other social media data, these are not representatives of the, of, of the population at large, and, uh, and so they have to be used in combination with other sources, and they have to be very fine through official statistics. But again, early indication of trends that can be really helpful from a policymaking perspective and a programming perspective. Um, and then uh, maybe last couple of things that I'm going to mention, and sorry if I'm, I'm taking too long, but we've also uh, been trying to facilitate uh, dialogue between private and public actors through the studio concept that uh, was, uh, um, was first um, sort of designed by the Gov Lab as well uh, as part of the Data for Migration Alliance. So here we gather basically representatives from different uh, different sectors and the policy making side, civil society uh, and, and private sector to understand what kind of new data sets could be um, used and could be harnessed to answer specific policy questions. And we organized the first of these discussions in, uh, in West Africa. We looked at the regional perspective and particularly mobility and migration trends. And we're planning to uh, organize more of these, uh, of these discussions later on. Um, maybe I will just, I'm just going to leave it at that. I hope I gave, it's very uh, short time, but I hope I gave a bit of a sense of, uh, of our work. Uh, and there's a lot more to say. I'm sure that we'll go into that um, uh, during the discussion. So back to you, Bas. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marcia. Uh, impressive stuff and, uh, and some really interesting examples uh, of how you're using um, new or non-traditional data sources for understanding uh, uh, something that di difficult as uh, migration flows, which are often irregular, uh, informal. Um, so thanks. Um, I didn't see any questions uh, uh, yet. So people, if you have any questions, feel free to share them with us. Um, uh, we are looking forward also to your uh, comments and suggestions and questions. Um, so Tyler, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, great, thanks, Boss. And can everyone see my slides okay? Yes, we can see it perfectly fine. Excellent. Um, Marcia, thanks for that really interesting presentation as well. We've actually used two of the approaches that you mentioned, especially around Facebook advertising data and Google Trends data, um, to triangulate in conjunction with um, things like on the ground data collection and representative um, surveys. And um, really interesting stuff. Um, so th thanks for sharing that. Um, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening, colleagues. I'm Tyler. I'm part of the humanitarian OpenStreetMap team. And as you can see on my slide, 
I'm going to be talking today about big data with, by, and for people on the move. So if you leave my opening with just two key messages today, it's these. Number one, in a world seemingly filled with data, we still have massive data gaps in many areas of the world. And number two, most big data and even small data sources compile data about people on the move, but are not created with and by them. So yes, this presents really complex ethical privacy and protection considerations. And we'll talk about some of those later on today. But what's more, um, in our opinion, it's a massive missed opportunity. People on the move, especially survivors of forced migration, are often holders of an incredible wealth of knowledge that the humanitarian system has not yet determined how to fully leverage. So rather than passive beneficiaries of aid, if implemented responsibly, people affected by displacement can serve as invaluable partners in providing data. So let me explain a bit more about this. So we find ourselves in the year 2021 and astoundingly areas of our world home to at least 1 billion people are still not represented in detail in any public data source. So in the map you see on the right, darker green means more people and pretty well mapped. Darker red means more people, but little map data available. So this missing map problem is especially true for people who have been forced to migrate. Humanitarian actors are then operating with very minimal data, limiting their contextual understanding of place. When entire human settlements, such as refugee camps, do not appear in digital maps, decisions need to be made based on generalizations rather than hyper-local analysis of the assets, vulnerabilities, infrastructure, and services available in the places people move from and to. Um, so example number one, when my organization, Humanitarian Open Street Map Team, first started working in Uganda in 2017, if you traveled to the north of the country into the BDBD refugee settlement and opened up the default map app on your phone, the screenshot on the left is exactly what you would see. So if you haven't been there, BDBD was at the time the world's largest refugee settlement. Um, BDBD and surrounding settlements make up an area twice the size of Paris and home to as many people as Orlando or a city the size of Pittsburgh. Yet no matter how much you zoomed in, it was represented only by a single pin. This is literally what it looked like on the map. This lack of data in 2021 is quite simply an indignity and an injustice to hundreds of thousands of people who live in this place. It may not be the world's biggest injustice, but not appearing on the map is one that we can solve and one that may make the difference between disaster and dignity for the people living there. Effective communities themselves using their own mobile devices and with local knowledge of the places they live help to fix this, eventually making the most comprehensive digital and open map of Uganda refugee settlements that has ever existed. So this photo, what you're seeing here, depicts what we call a mapathon, an event at which both refugees, host community members, and aid workers come together to make a digital map. Um, and you can see satellite imagery on the laptop there. So looking at that satellite image, you really easily see roads and buildings. And by drawing digital lines on top of what you see, using a simple tool based on OpenStreetMap, a digital map is created that is immediately available to all. And those little flashes you see on the bottom right hand of your screen are individual segments of roads all over northern Uganda being added to OpenStreetMap. Um, so by working in conjunction with UNHCR, the data that was created by refugees became part of the official Uganda refugees portal and therefore accessible freely and openly to any NGO and any resident working or living in the area. We call this the base map. And so what, why should you care about this? Why should you care about this missing maps problem? Well, you put a decent base map in place and it becomes possible to then do much more interesting things. We can start to pinpoint populated areas without safe drinking water or lacking access to latrines. Um, and by bringing together refugees and host community members, you also witness a transformation. Uh, and this relates to peace building, really from survivor of forced migration to active leader in ensuring everyone is included in humanitarian data sets and in holding the system accountable. Um, so I'll go really quickly through this next example. This was from um, the beginning of the second largest Ebola outbreak in history in 2018 in Eastern DRC. And given really heavy migration across the border uh, from Western Uganda and DRC, 
there was a need to rapidly get data on points of entry on the Uganda side of the border. In the southwest of the country, we know that there are 24 manned points of entry across four border districts. But what was less known was this, where were people crossing without going through one of those formal points of entry or formal checkpoints? Where do you think we would actually get that information? Um, who knows best, right? So how about asking the community health workers and the people actually living there? Involving them as active leaders in the map making process is exactly what happened. Um, that was in conjunction with IOM. A handful of hot staff trained volunteers, including Red Cross volunteers and community health workers, to fill out simple forms using Open Data Kit. And through dozens of individual volunteers contributing, we came to know that there were actually 110 points of entry uh, through rivers and forests and streams, uh, not 24 points of entry. And importantly, the blank spots in the free and open map of the world um, used by the humanitarian system, OpenStreetMap, got filled in. So hyper-local data of facilities around each border crossing were added, helping to explain drivers behind cross-border movement. So um, if you join the panel today to hear about big data, I'd like to challenge you first to think small, think hyper-local, think micro. So big data can be formed from these micro contributions of knowledge, and those contributions not only can, but must respect each person's dignity as an individual and as a highly valued uh, holder of local knowledge. This is a little bit about us and what we do. Um, we're an organization that sees ourselves both as an NGO, but really to support this global movement around open mapping. And so most of our work is done by volunteer contributors. Um, we have 200,000 of them around the world in more than 50 countries. And we're working to make that um, closer to 100 countries in the next five years. And um, this is really our vision, a world in which everyone is counted. And we, when we say counted, it means um, visible and included in decision making. That map data is accessible and used in decisions that save and improve lives. And that everyone can engage and contribute their own local knowledge of their place to the map. Um, so Boss, thanks. I'll turn it back to you. Thanks, uh, Tyler, a really interesting uh, presentation. Um, and it's interesting to see that a map, something that's so, uh, that, that, that seems so neutral, right? An objective, uh, in fact, is so, uh, so political and it matters whether you're included uh, or not um, in or during humanitarian disasters, but, uh, but also in general, I'd say. So uh, thank you very much. Um, Linus, I wanted to give the floor to you for your uh, opening remarks. Go ahead. Great. Thanks a lot. Fantastic presentations, Marcia and uh, Tyler. I, I think this is a nice, nice compliment that I will present. Let's see. Do you see my screen? Yeah. Okay. Great. Let's see. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so my name is Linus Bengtsson. I'm the one of the co-founders, and I used to be the executive director for uh, for Flowminder up until a few weeks ago, and and now I'm taking the role as chair of the board and working much more on long-term strategic questions, which is very nice. Um, and uh, we are um, we're a nonprofit. We're we're based in Sweden, but a lot of staff also in the UK and uh, Switzerland. Um, doing having producing a lot of data products on mobility, uh, done a lot of research on mobile operator data, how that can be used to understand migration and, and mobility patterns. Um, so research has been a big part uh, of our work, but in the last couple of years, uh, been very focused and become the biggest part of our, our work to support organizations and, and governments to make use of this type of data for uh, for decision making and in making uh, software open source software to be able to process this type of data and to analyze it and and um, and uh, reduce biases in uh, in the data um as i said we we started in haiti uh, in, in 2010 after the earthquake and and then we've been expanding to low and middle income countries uh, in many places, and, and uh, here are places where we are working with MNOs uh, now, or have had major projects before. When I when I um, talk, okay, let's flick through more than once. 
slide at the time sometimes. Uh, so when I talk about mobile operator data, uh, it's it's data that mobile operators are registering for, for billing purposes. So um, a, a user making a, a billable event like a call, then the call is, is routed through a mobile phone tower uh, and that tower is, is registered. And if the user then uh, moves and makes another call and the call is then routed through another tower, uh, we can deduce a move in the data. And so this allows us for, for all the users on that network uh, to understand their trajectories. And the, the data is always de-identified. So we don't know the actual mobile phone number. It's, it's a, an anonymous code, but uh, it's still very sensitive and, and privacy is a huge part of, of this. And um, just a few key principles we're, we're employing uh, is that we move the code to the data where it's always been stored, usually at the mobile operator's premise. And what comes out uh, uh, after the processing is aggregated statistics. So we, we never share individual level mobile data. And as a, as a Swedish and EU organization, we're regulated by GDPR, which has been really a, a really good, big, uh, important step, I think, for the whole data science um, industry. Um, so probably we'll talk more about this later on. I'll, I'll talk a bit about first the applications in the humanitarian sphere, and then uh, mention at the end also some really important uh, um, conceptual issues I think we can do with uh, migration data. Um, first, for so dividing the, the sort of the humanitarian situation into the, the early response phase, the aftermath and, and reconstruction phase, and and crisis preparedness. We, there are a few different things we can we can do. The, the first most obvious thing is to, in a in in that early phase of a, of a after a disaster or a crisis of some type, we can see how the phones are moving and to what areas phones have moved from their home area into that area. So we can get an estimate of the number of displaced persons in in, in an area. And this is data from the, the earthquake earlier this year in, in, in Haiti, southwest of, uh, of Haiti. Um, the other, the other, uh, the next phase sort of a, a, of a humanitarian um, crisis is, is the uh, um, when people are starting to move back. And we can, for each area, then we can see the rate of returns. This is data from, from the earthquake in Nepal in 2015, where we provided a lot of support. And we can see to what areas people are returning and, and where they are returning more slowly. Um, and obviously we don't know why that is the, the case, why they're returning more slowly to one area than another. But of course, that's a very important indication of, uh, of something going on in the, in, in these, in the respective areas. Uh, for preparedness, there's also a lot of things we can do. So the first is just to understand population densities, how they vary over time. So people are, are moving regularly and uh, overnight and day, seasons, uh, uh, weekday, weekend, these changes. And we can under have an understanding of how densities change uh, in, in an area. We can, in the middle here, so to the left is data from Haiti. In, in the middle, you see uh, movements in, in, uh, in DRC where we work a lot. So just understanding how normal movements are and taking that into account in your planning is of course very important or for understanding how infectious diseases spread. Um, and really exciting and more, maybe more on the sort of the data science side is that we also see that we can predict quite well how people will move in, in a disaster, uh, in a future disaster. So we've seen in, in a number of disasters that people, they don't move randomly, of course, they move to where they have social support. And, and we've seen in Haiti, for example, in repeatedly that people move to uh, where they spent Christmas before, where they had their social support, uh, where they moved by the, when they have time off. And we can also see comparing different disasters that the rate of return is actually quite irregular. Uh, so uh, we can actually have a good understanding beforehand on, on the rate of, of, of returns. Um, and then finally, moving a little bit more conceptually and, and in the migration uh, area, I think I want to flag three major possibilities. One, one is the what I've almost pretty much mentioned here, that uh, movements can be very, very small in one, in one place, and they can be really small trickles. But when you have all this data in a country, uh, you can see that these small movements on an aggregate scale can become very, can be very, very large. 
which I haven't been able to understand before. Um, you can also, so normally you have, uh, it's very expensive to do studies of, of, of how people are moving within a country. And you might have an area where you're following how households and you regularly go there and ask, uh, has anybody moved out? And that means that you can measure out migration. But, uh, but interestingly, you don't in those study setting, study setups measure the, the number of people coming in and setting up new households. So while you see that there's an event, uh, a change in something, and you see concurrently movements out of the area goes up, but at, at the same time, actually, you might have a lot more people coming in, which you don't know about, and which gives you a completely different picture. And um, and the same thing regards in regards to incidence and duration of migration episodes. You might see at an event, okay, a lot of people are moving out, but actually they're spending a lot less time out away from their home. Uh, so in total, there might actually be less people on the move from that specific area at the given time point. But what you see is that there's an increase uh, uh, in a certain uh, in conjunction with a certain event. So having all this data really gives us a possibility to understand much more in much more detail what's what's going on. So I think there are a lot of exciting uh, possibilities and the references down there can give you more information uh, on this. So uh, this is very brief and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll stop there and uh, give it over to you, Bas. Thanks. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Linus. Um, uh, very interesting presentation and I think also a very interesting data source um, you're using. And um, perhaps we also uh, discuss a little bit also uh, more in depth the, the ethical side to this and how you are managing this, uh, this in practice, uh, which you also mentioned, I think, a little bit in your presentation. Um, so um, let us move on to sort of the next topic, so to say, and discuss um, also a little bit, not only the ethical side of your work and challenges perhaps, uh, but also some of the, the obstacles or difficulties that you had encountered in your work and how you have overcome the, those. Because I think we can all learn learn from that, whether you're working on migration or in the humanitarian field or in the, the peace building uh, domain. I think you can uh, learn a lot from best practices and your work and how you use this, these data sources in your work. That's very valuable. But perhaps also we can learn a little bit from you, from the path, how you came to where you are now. So uh, Marcia, maybe one question for you. Uh, you mentioned that, of course, one of the key things you're doing is um, uh, not only collecting data or helping others to collect data, but also collect data sources and disclose these uh, to the public. But data sources come in many forms um, and in many different configurations. So how do you, how do you manage to, to design this portal, um, uh, organize all these different types and sets of data um, in a way that is um, uh, that workable for you guys, uh, and uh, make sense to us as users of all the data that you are uh, making available to us. Thanks so much, uh, Bas, for the question and congratulations as well to uh, Linus and Tyler for, for all their work. It's, uh, it's, it's really uh, fantastic to, to, hear it, um, to hear about it today. Uh, I think uh, maybe just a little clarification on your question, Bas. So the Global Migration Data Portal uh, basically provides access to statistics on international migration from a variety of sources, right? And so uh, you would have, you know, estimates of uh, numbers of international migrants from the UN Department of Social and um, Economic and Social Affairs, and provides estimates, you know, uh, of, uh, of international migrants based on national population censuses around the world, uh, remittances data from the World Bank, you know, data on migration flows from OECD, and other data sources. So what we're basically doing is provide a one-stop shop, as we call it, for all this data on you know, 70 different uh, indicators from 30 different international providers, and uh, also provide some sort of, you know, facilitate the analysis of these data. And so we have also some thematic pages where we summarize um, you know, uh, data on different topics, the recent trends, but mostly what are the strengths and weaknesses of the data because every data source comes with, with its own issues and its own bias. And this is true for the traditional statistics and it's true for the even more so for obviously the new data sources. And so 
we really have to, and something that we really stress is that we really have to be uh, able to communicate uh, these types of, of biases and challenges and limitations, more than challenges, is limitations really, so that you know, for every data source, there's certain limitations and these numbers cannot be taken at face value. When we say, you know, 280 million international migrants around the world, what does the mean, where does the number come from and how, uh, you know, is, that, is it true now and based on what kind of, um, you know, estimations and projections. And we have to really be able to explain that, uh, where those numbers come from, because those numbers are then taken and used in different kinds of narratives uh, around migration. So that is, is key, right? Um, and that is, so for, for the Global Migration Data Portal, when it comes to our work uh, you know, with new data sources, and for now we've been experimenting with data that is publicly available, right? Uh, the Facebook advertising platform uh, provides estimates of the numbers of users that correspond to certain characteristics, for instance, how many are, have changed their country of usual residence, uh, uh, you know, and we don't know when, and that's where the problem lies. You know, we have a statistical definition of an international migrant, uh, we um, do not know how many, you know, for instance, users of Facebook have, uh, when those users who have changed their country of residence did that, can we classify them as international migrants or not? Um, you know, so these issues with definitions that are used and how, uh, and, you know, how to adapt sort of migration related definitions and where we need to do so to be able to use these different data sources in combination, right? So this is more the, the challenges, let's say, on the, on the technical side, um, but it's also the availability of this data beyond what is publicly available, even if it's aggregate and anonymized. Uh, and, and that is where sort of this partnership element and this dialogue uh, element yeah. comes in. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, very interesting. And you also mentioned in your presentation um, that you're supporting ethical data innovation. Um, and if there would be maybe one key innovation that you would uh, like to share with everybody, uh, what would be the key, the number one innovation uh, that we should all take into account in terms of uh, the ethical side of data collection, data use, data analysis? Yeah. Um, so this is a this is a really fundamental topic, and I'm actually glad that uh, also Tyler mentioned this uh, this aspect of engaging with the communities, engaging with the ultimate the data subjects. You no, know, we call the data subjects the ultimate users and the ultimate you know, uh, the people that we're trying to assist uh, in this uh, in this work, and engaging with local actors and building capacities of also local actors to be able to facilitate the exchange, right, from the, the, the big analysis at the national to the regional level, but also the engagement of local actors and their capacities to translate uh, sort of this and engage local communities in these discussions. So something that we are quite excited about, but we're just about to start, so I'm not sure we, we could call it uh, yet a, a, an innovation in the sense, but uh, we've been talking um, or we've been planning sort of the organization of a studio discussion around the topic of digital self-determination, as also with colleagues uh, in the Big Data for Migration Alliance, Stefan Verhulst, and that is, you know, when it comes to ethical uh, use of data, um, I think we have to, uh, not I think, you know, um, this is also what experts say, but it's, uh, we need to go beyond the you know, data protection and data confidentiality issue and issues of consent towards involvement and empowerment of uh, of the data subjects and of communities around the use of data that is coming from you know, their own use of, for instance, digital platforms or mobile phone data, et cetera. And so how, and how do we do that, right? And that, that is kind of the, the question that we would like to explore. Uh, what does it mean to, you know, to have digital self-determination? How can we go beyond consent? Uh, uh, what are the actors that need to be you know, involved in this? And so is it the regulators and you know, people working on um, legislative frameworks uh, around these policymakers, private sector entities, as well as international organizations, uh, NGOs, and, uh, and actors involved you know, in, in these different topics. This is something that we, uh, we will launch uh, also uh, next year in discussion that I think will, will help. But there's a, lot, uh, there's a lot else ongoing, right? And it's uh, um, obviously, we had also this discussion on Monday in our event, and there are, and I think a key point also that emerges is that there are frameworks, there are, you know, uh, obviously regulatory frameworks, but this can be, first of all, not necessarily applied in practice. And so, you know, uh, when the frameworks exist, how do we 
how do we make sure that they're enforced? Uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, sorry, that's maybe I'm taking it on. <laughs> no, no, sorry, I was just uh, going on okay. and on. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. No, but this makes total sense. And um, and I was also wondering, uh, Tyler, because uh, I think Marcia mentioned uh, the the issue like you of uh, of ownership of data and accountability. Um, and you you said in your presentation that um, migrants themselves are, of course, also data producers. You you said that they produce invaluable data. And I was wondering, also from an ethical perspective, uh, we we learned from your presentation that being included, included or not on a map is very political uh, and can change people's lives. And of course, this can be, can be for, the, for the good, right? for good, right? Because uh, this enables people to understand where refugee camps are, where, where they need uh, more access to, to water or sanitation, for example. But we also see uh, certain regimes using migrants um, uh, as a hybrid weapon some, some would say, we see it in Belarus and Poland happening right now. Um, we know that there are human traffickers, of course, that may use this invaluable data, that may use this data and may, which may prove invaluable to them uh, to exploit refugees and migrants, for example, or to abuse them. So what's your take on this? How, how do we deal with this, this, with this issue? Yes, we need to include people on the map, but including them on, map, on maps may make them more vulnerable to abuse as well. Yeah, Boss, thanks for asking that question. It's a very, very relevant one. And just to be straightforward, it's a very difficult one, right? And it's one that we all um, that we need to grapple with. And it, there's not a global answer to it. It's really a, a localized answer. What I will say, there, there's a couple of principles we keep in mind. Um, and I'll, I'll borrow a few words from my colleague, Ivan Gayton, um, who often talks about this and says, um, it's about power, right? If we think about who which organizations in our world hold a lot of the power and a lot of, um, a lot of the knowledge and historically have held a lot of the, the map data. It's often militaries, it's often government actors. Um, and the groups that are actually lacking in data are the, um, are the service providers um, beyond government, the NGOs, the community organizations that are actually serving um, populations at, in need. So what we're re essentially trying to do is level the playing field, is to get those actors the same data that the um, government agencies and military sometimes already have access to. Um, now that's, you know, that's a broad generalization. I think the other important thing is that um, in leveling the playing field, there's a, there's a question of who decides, right? So who decides whether to uh, be, whether a community or a household or a facility or a certain type of infrastructure should be on the map or not on the map. Um, at the end of the day, the principle we go by is that the community themselves should make the determination. So as much we do work from satellite imagery, but as much as possible, we complement that by also working through what we call local open street map communities, which are community volunteers on the ground um, who are collecting data themselves or working with people on the move um, to help source some of that local knowledge. With OpenStreetMap, um, the owners of OpenStreetMap are the contributors. So if you look at the data license, um, OpenStreetMap contributors own the data. That means that if you're adding something to the map, you also have the right to remove it from the map and you can determine the level of detail that goes into the map. You might, for example, draw a rectangle around the building, but you might not indicate, you might choose for one reason or another not to indicate the use of that building, um, maybe whether it's a school or a health facility. Um, the other, maybe one more thought on this is that we often kind of look to some, um, some basic ethical principles that I think the um, HHI signal code is, is a really uh, pertinent one here in terms of data ethics. We are careful not to map um, personally identifiable information. So the, the work we do in OpenStreetMap is often about things that are already physically observable on the ground, infra um, infrastructure, for example. And we're often, we're also really careful in the example I gave with um, the Uganda South Sudan border of community or demographically identify, identifiable information. So really careful on mapping characteristics of a service or a building that might indicate who it serves or what population groups live in that area. And that could be, there's a lot of ways to determine that. It could be 
um, through the language used or through the types of services provided um, uh, um, at a health facility or a house of worship, for example. Um, so those are all things to keep in mind. And as we, as we kind of scale um, and support communities doing this, because at the end of the day, it's not our staff, it's communities who are doing this around the world. Uh, we're aiming to just provide some thoughtful guidance and checklists and um, tools that they can use to help, to help them to make the best decision that's, that makes sense locally. Boz, I think you are still muted. Sorry, thanks. I was complimenting you a lot. As I was saying, it was very interesting. And um, basically what you're doing is uh, democrat democratizing uh, maps, right? Uh, so it doesn't, it's not only um, who's on a map or not, but also who decides what is being shown on a map. And uh, just um, uh, a briefly uh, follow-up question. So what would be the, the single most uh, important obstacle you would, say, you would say that keeps us from uh, democratizing uh, our maps? Um, 10 years ago, I would have said it's, um, it's trust. And, and that issue still exists today, um, trust in citizen-generated data. If you look at the work of, and, and Marcia kind of hinted at this earlier, but the work of statisticians, we work a lot with national statistics offices. This is still a crazy and new concept um, using crowdsourced data, using data from OpenStreetMap. Um, and there's often the question of, can we rely on it? Is it trustworthy? Um, I think what we've seen, we, we've kind of tried to shift that conversation to, is it fit for purpose? Is it contributing in some way? And what we've really seen is um, over the years, kind of like Wikipedia, the more people that we have editing the map. And it's not, when, when I talk about map contributors nowadays, it's the biggest technology companies in the world that are contributing. It's the biggest NGOs in the world that are contributing. It's the World Bank, it's the UN. Um, so OpenStreetMap is not, when I say volunteer contributors, it's, it's people from all of those agencies, as well as community members, all working together in the same data source which means that that issue of trust, which, which was an issue is becoming less and less of an issue because the more people and the more organizations that are working together to improve the map becomes more trustworthy over time, becomes more fit for purpose over time. So yeah, um, yeah I think that's the, and, and the other thing I'll, I'll just say quickly is the biggest obstacle I think we have today is really the humanitarian system needing to make a huge mindset shift. And uh, again, Marcia hinted at this earlier, but shifting from this um, concept of like, let's, let's get consent to let's get beyond consent. And actually let's, I mean, there's been some high profile cases of where we're still not getting consent, right? Um, but beyond consent, let's look at this more holistically as two, two way communication with affected communities and with people on the move. Um, so that's really like the value add that we need to be moving towards. Yeah, thanks. Um, so Linus, I was I was wondering uh, two things, uh, and we are we are already uh, nearing the end of our um, uh, of our session. Uh, so I will be brief, uh, and maybe uh, you can be a little bit brief as well. Uh, I'm sorry about that. Um, so one question is um, the type of data you're using. Um, I think it's quite large large quantities of data, right? So is this an obstacle for your analysis and? Is this also possible to do this type, to process this type of data, for example, in, in areas where the internet connection is not so, so good or, uh, so can you maybe reflect a little bit on that? And maybe are there also some ethical lessons that you want to share with us that you, that you saw in your work and that you may have overcome over the years? Thanks, thanks a lot, Bas. Um, good, try to be brief. Um, data size, yeah, it's, Big sizes, but it's not—it's not that huge. Uh, I mean, a, a, a normal processor these days goes <laughs> a long way. Uh, we we never bring the data away from where it's stored. So we usually we bring either the operator has it themselves, resources themselves, or we ship in a server and that we give to them, and they they strip off all the identifying information from they they replace phone numbers and other identifiers. 
with, a, with an anonymous code and they put it on this separate server that where we have uh, where we can where it can be processed and, and doesn't conflict with our system um, and so it's usually a quite standard server uh, when it comes into doing it, it the problem is more when you do very uh, complex analysis of the data deep learning networks on the on the data, then you you need a lot of processing. But just to handle the kind of the, the, the more fundamentals, it's 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 quite fine, uh, and that means that we only need to send commands uh, for the processing, and that's not very much. So we're we're not so limited by by bandwidth, and that has also changed a lot. I, uh, I mean, ten years ago was a big difference um, internet connectivity in Africa. Um, good, and the um, the ethical uh, side, I. I mean, we've, I think it's been a very, uh, it's been a, for us to very good development. Uh, like before, when we started a decade ago, this was not really there. This discussion was not there. There was a enormous enthusiasm when we showed this, this type of outputs, but, but this discussion wasn't there. And that also made it very much harder for us to argue for, for funding, uh, setting up a lot of the, uh, I mean, the, the just the GDPR framework I mentioned before, it, 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 it's great, but, uh, but the cost of implementing it, it it's, uh, it's high. And to motivate that to donors had been pretty impossible before, I would say. And now it's a much more standard, uh, standard um, thing. So, uh, so it's, it's a very good evolution, I would say. Uh, for us, uh, being brief, but I uh, wanted to say the, the problem for us is largely the, the what you mentioned about the unintended consequences of, of the data. In general, I, I would say, like you said, Tyler, leveling the playing field is the way to go. We, we want this uh, good data to be shared and accessible to, to everybody. Uh, and usually the, it's, it's for us, it's aggregated to a scale, which you, it's, it's very similar to other data sources on movements, but it's just that the date, the quality is much higher. But but still the unintended consequences is the really tricky thing. And so what we're doing is, is uh, we've got funding now in two countries to set up civil society committees, uh, ethical review uh, by, by civil society about the application and how, and how we work uh, to produce analysis and outputs. And, uh, and then please just come back if you, uh, if anyone can think about uh, issues and have experiences, you know, please reach out because we want to know about it. Great, thank you. Um, I had promised a Q&A, but I, uh, I saw there was one question um, and it was for you, Tyler. Maybe uh, can you quickly, quickly reflect on this? Uh, Paige had asked um, whether you have particular examples of how um, OpenStreetMap has been used to improve accountability and governance um, at the community level and beyond. Um, yeah, just really quickly, Vas, on that, and thanks, Paige, for that question. Um, for us, uh, oftentimes accountability means inclusion. So when when I thought about this, when I'm thinking about this question, um, a couple ex couple examples come to mind. So we work quite frequently in public health programs, and one of those is um, in, indoor residual spraying for malaria um, to reach um, sort of. Uh, um, the appropriate threshold in an area is typically considered 80%, um, and which means 80% of households need to receive um, spray coverage. What we often find is that the spray teams that are working in the field often are missing certain um, sort of remote uh, villages or certain subsets of households because they don't have that data on the map. And so for us, when we think about um, Ac accountability. It's about accountability and receiving basic services like those types of interventions, uh, bed nets or individual uh, indoor residual spraying. Um, and the other, the other piece about, I think there's an advocacy component as well. One thing that we are kind of just touching the tip of the iceberg on is how can communities use maps and data to actually advocate for their basic needs. We talked about this a little bit with my Northern Uganda example where communities themselves were able to tell uh, the UN and uh, NGOs working in the, in the area where they did not have access to clean and safe drinking water. And they were able to do that through maps. But I, I'm really excited about the work of some other organizations. Digital Democracy is one. 
that does really fantastic work about using maps with indigenous communities for advocacy purposes. Um, and so, uh, yeah, highly encourage you to check out their work as well. Great, thank you very much. And also thanks for sharing uh, some other interesting examples that maybe you've used to, um, to us and uh, people in the audience. And uh, we have reached uh, the end of our session. So I want to uh, thank Linus, Marcia and Tyler very much for, for being here and sharing your, your knowledge uh, and your thoughts with us. Thank you very much. I am applauding and um, Unfortunately, we cannot see the audience, but I'm sure everybody is also uh, applauding you. Um, uh, thank you also to the audience. Uh, like I said, we, we couldn't see you, unfortunately. Hopefully next year we can meet again face to face. But thank you for joining uh, this session. I hope you found it useful. I know I did. Um, also a big thanks to, uh, New, to um, New York University, um, to Paige and Branca and all the others who are organizing this event to Selassie for the technical advice for this uh, uh, technical assistance for this session. Um, uh, thank you very much. Have a great evening. You can see the video of the session on NYU's uh, YouTube channel and enjoy the rest uh, of the conference and have a good day and a good evening. <laughs>